All right, everybody's in. Thank you so much, Carrie. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Louisiana Rare Disease Day. We are thrilled to have you joining us today on the Saturday. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and kick off the program today with two short videos. Um, a little housekeeping too, if you don't mind making sure that you are on mute if you're not speaking today, that would really help with any background noise. And then with bandwidth and videos we're finding in this virtual world, if you don't mind turning off your camera just for the video presentation, and then you're welcome to turn your camera back on. Sometimes that helps with the quality. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that video started and then we will kick it off. I Namaste Shafiq. Regina, habari asubuhi havi. Yai un kristiano yai bori Norge. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunisia, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Minha sorrotana. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Ana penda com itazama ni que poliza ma povo. Yai el querida, os pelos pelo ma família, né? Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari-harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O var me pulogue. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. Atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Como o nome do teu wangu wa kiyume anavifurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik hubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Their fierce support. Sua bondade inabalável. Minibanguer. Enfermeiras. Support workers. Assistente. Mashirika e wagonjoa. Together, we are a strong community. Mimeweza kuelekeu. Histórias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Ou como se ele tivesse. I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has CASC, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafiq dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha a leomiosarcoma, um câncer raro. Who you need, Harvey? And a SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. You want to see how I hurt you? Me for better, Charlotte. Esta é minha vida, sua resaia. And I am more than my disease. We are rare. Camira mãe, nós somos fortes. And we are proud. We just have one more short video to start with. Welcome. I'm Peter Saltonstall, President and CEO of the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and would like to welcome you to our 2021 Virtual Rare Disease Day event. Before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the rare disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and patients from around the world to help tell the story about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country today. And some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those in the state legislatures where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them, and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. As a matter of fact, NORD's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils. We've got them set up down 16 states and are building them in others. I think 2021 is going to be an interesting year for us. The reason I say that is because we've just come off of a very difficult year with a pandemic that's impacted the rare disease community in a number of different ways 
and has really shown some of the inequities in the healthcare system. For all of you that are watching today, the importance of the rare disease advisory councils is critical to the success of being able to communicate the story and the needs of the rare disease patient community. So in conclusion, I would really like to make sure that I recognize and thank all of those sponsors who have helped us make this day a reality. Without your continued support, none of this would happen. So a sincere thank you from all of us at NORD and the patient community. Taking part in events like today's are really important to the rare disease community. And we must always remember that alone we are rare and together we are strong. Okay, thank you everyone. And feel free to turn back on those cameras if you would like. And at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to our fantastic volunteer, Libby. Uh, before I do so, I did want to just let you know that um, NOR does not provide any medical um, advice. And so we'll go ahead and drop our disclosure in the chat if anyone has any questions. But with that, take it away, Libby. So welcome, everybody. Thank you guys so much for showing up on this Saturday here. Um, I want to thank Speaker McGee for showing up, uh, Dr. Kenneth Paris and Dr. Hans Anderson, um, and for Ms. Kay Dodd for setting this up with Speaker McGee and um, all of the Nord ladies who helped this along. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I know both of our doctors know how much I appreciate all of you guys being here. So thank you. Perfect. Thanks again for joining us. As mentioned, my name is Elise Patel and I serve as our Western Region State Policy Manager for NORD. And we're really excited to talk today about NORD's Rare Disease Advisory Council work and also share why RDAC started and where we're headed this year. As many of you know, 25 to 30 million Americans are impacted by a rare disease, which breaks down to about one in 10 individuals. And while that is quite a few people directly impacted, we're finding that lawmakers don't necessarily know the unique challenges that are faced by the rare disease community. So our solution was to form rare disease advisory councils where a group of diverse individuals from the rare disease community could come together and advise state government. And this is especially important because we know that many of our healthcare decisions are made at the state level. We also see these art acts as an enormous opportunity for both the community and legislators to come together and partner in a more strategic way and help address the issues that are faced on a regular basis. The first council was actually created in 2015 by some wonderful volunteers in North Carolina and since then has gained traction across the country. And as you'll see in this slide, we currently have 16 states that have passed RDAC legislation, with Massachusetts being the last state to do so um, just last month. And much of this progress has happened over the course of the last two years, with 10 governors signing RDAC legislation into law since 2019. So NORD launched Project RDAC this past year as a way to really help optimize the existing RDACs and also increase the number of RDACs in states across the country. And under this initiative, NORD will be providing opportunities for RDACs to collaborate with each other and will also be providing educational resources to guide RDACs every step of the way. So I welcome you to visit our website rarediseases.org and click on our Project RDAC tab. We'll also drop the link in the chat as well. Here you'll find resources, our upcoming events when we have coalition meetings, and also our interactive state map where you can hover over a state and find out their specific information. And currently we do not have a Rare Disease Advisory Council in Louisiana. However, we're hoping with all of your help here today, we can start the path towards establishing a council in the state. Um, and this will include needing to build a diverse coalition of stakeholders from the entire rare disease community to make sure that everyone's voice is heard in the process. So if you are interested in being part of the RDAC efforts in Louisiana, we welcome you to email us at rdac at rarediseases.org. 
and we will happily loop you into our work as we um, get started. And I also wanted to briefly go over our Nord State Report Card. This is our sixth year publishing a state report card. And the report card is a tool that we use to help evaluate how effectively states are serving the rare disease community. It's a way for us to track individual state progress on priority policy issues as seen on this slide and also enable effective advocacy by providing a tangible tool to see how your state measures up in key areas. And the issues outlined touch on several critical and relevant policy areas. However, we do understand that there are still other policy areas that may impact the lives of rare disease patients. This year, we transitioned our report to a new interactive digital format. And there is a state report card landing page as well as a web page for each of the eight issues that are highlighted in the report. So feel free to use the link that's provided here and um, check out how Louisiana is doing. And then also I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick video demo of how to navigate the, re or the website if you're interested. Oh, sorry, I guess. I apologize, I, we don't have that video, but um, if you do go to that website, it is pretty user-friendly. You can do a drop down to, to um, pick the state you wanna look at. We also have uh, appendix and grading methodologies. So as far as our methodology goes for the state report card, all of the data from the report is as of November, 2020, with the exception of the Rare Disease Advisory Councils. We actually updated the RDAX through December to reflect the exciting passage of both the RDAX in Ohio and Massachusetts in December of 2020. Um, and then any current bills that are in the state legislature now or bills that may have already even passed in the beginning of 2021 were not factored into that report card or grade. Um, and you'll see that each issue has its own appendix where we derive the overall grade from and each individual issue page also contains that grading methodology section where you can read more about how each issue was evaluated. And so with that, um, I welcome you to reach out to our policy team if you have any questions at all regarding our project RDAC or the state report card, if you have any questions after having a chance to look at that, um, you can reach us by emailing us at policy at rarediseases.org. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Libby, who's going to be introducing our next speaker. Thank you. So thank you guys for that. Thank you, Elise. Um, I just want to um, introduce everybody to the speaker, uh, Tanner McGee, for the Louisiana House of Representatives. Thank y'all. and uh, Thank y'all for having me. I really appreciate y'all having me on uh, to talk to y'all today. I think first, you know, I um, experienced rare disease. At least, um, and I apologize for my car background, but I'm, I'm at a volleyball tournament for my kids. And I'm kind of doing the in-between games uh, to talk, come talk to y'all. Um, I first became aware of rare disease. My dad was diagnosed with one, and he was actually misdiagnosed with one and was eventually diagnosed with a common disease. However, we had about a six-month period where we thought he had a rare disease. And I remember the feelings that he had and our feelings of of wanting information and wanting to know more about the, the condition he had and it not really being readily available or you couldn't find it from the doctors you had in your hometown and the struggle we had to kind of figure out what it had and what it meant for him. Um, and so that was my first real contact with, with rare diseases. Um, and I, it, it definitely had an impact on I me mean, and I definitely uh, sympathize with what y'all go through. As far as legislation and legislators, I would I would tell you the best way of advocacy is really a grassroots approach to start early, figuring out and finding out what time session starts. This year it starts April 12th um, and getting, calling up your state representative, your state senator, asking to meet with them on an individual level. And you'll, I think you'll be surprised they really will be willing to. If they don't, follow up with an email um, and say, you know, I would like to talk to you about this topic. I won't take much of your time. I'll be really quick and brief. And um, at least just have a phone call or something like that. And if they don't respond, just kind of stay on them, but not aggressive to the point where you put, push them away, but enough to where you're, you're, you're really letting them know it's important to you. Um, and, and definitely put where you're from 
on any kind of contact information because they want to know they're talking to constituents. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, we, we have limited amount of time and resources. You don't want to spend it talking to somebody else's constituents. Um, so let them know that you are um, local to them. And then meet up with them and tell them what's going on and tell them how they can help. I think everybody wants to help. Uh, make the ask as simple as it can be sounding. You know, I'm just looking for this council. It doesn't cost money, blah, blah, blah. And ask them that many questions and concerns and how you can answer those questions and concerns. And then uh, let some time go by and then follow up with them a couple of weeks later and check in on with them and say, how's it going? You know, have you got any more thought on this issue? Can I count on your support kind of thing? And then as session goes on, really stay engaged. Uh, the good thing about Louisiana's capital is I can't speak for everybody else, but ours is really open to the public. I think people who come are really shocked by how easy it is to find people and how easy it is to grab them and say you want to talk to them. And you can, um, in our capital, everybody's really on the House floor uh, 15, 20 minutes before session starts and just grab them and say, hey, you know, I'm John Smith. I'm from Homa, Louisiana. I have a rare disease. I want to talk to you about some legislation. Do you have a minute to talk to me? And, you know, go from there. And then if, you know, make sure then use that legislator. Once you lock in on one of them, ask him, you know, who else can I talk to? Who else do I need to talk to? And then he'll direct you to somebody else um, within his chamber. Is there anybody out there that is, is against this? Do I need to go talk to them? Um, I can find somebody to talk to them and kind of build it out that way. Uh, you know, and I, I think you'll be shocked and amazed what you can accomplish when you do that. I remember a couple of years ago when I first got elected, we had a bill between the physical therapist and the pitted, pitted physical therapists against um, orthopedic surgeons. And everybody thought the orthopedic surgeons have more money, more lobbying. They would definitely uh, win this legislative fight. However, the physical therapists were so much more engaged. I mean, every, every time I turned around, there's a physical therapist uh, wanted to talk to me to make sure I was okay with their bill, and they won. I mean, at the end of the day, that sort of personal contact and that personal being there was really important. Um, and I, so I look forward to working with all of y'all. I, uh, I believe, you know, this advisory council is a huge step. It's a step that Louisiana absolutely needs to take. Um, and it's something that I will do anything I can to, uh, to be with y'all and work with y'all and take all the steps we need to do to set one up here. So if y'all ever need to reach out to me, um, my email address is McGee, M-A-G-E-E-T, at legis.la.gov. And legis is L-E-G-I-S. Um, and you can look it up on the website. It's all available. And email me, call me, and I'll do anything I can to help y'all. Thank y'all. Have a good day. Thank you, Tanner. Thank you. Okay, so um, I guess I'll just go through and kind of give you guys our story real quick um, about Amelie. The, um, she, we can, you guys can follow her on Facebook. She's at Amelie's Army on Facebook. Um, and we post her pictures and uh, updates about her very, very often. Amelie was born, she was a 31 weeker baby is what we call it. Um, she was born premature because she failed a fetal stress test, which means her heart started to decrease, um, her vital signs started decreasing and I started getting sicker. So they ended up having to take her um, very early. Um, we had no diagnosis in utero for her, um, even though I was very, very sick. Um, I, I spent probably seven and a half months, probably seven months in the hospital total, um, just trying to bake her to, you know, get her viable enough to be able to keep her. So 30 days in the NICU and we took her home still not knowing anything. Um, the first year of our life, we literally lived in a hospital. She began having apnea spells, uh, very, very, um, right when we got home with her, um, there were missed signs from our that our doctors should have realized with blood test and they should have seen her you know being hypoglycemic and they should have seen her being acidotic and all of these things that they should have seen and they just our pediatrician really just I felt like ignored them we ended up having to have a g2 placed uh, a feeding tube placed for her at 11 months old 
um, simply because she had her, she, because she had failure to thrive. She weighed seven pounds when we put her G2 in, G tube in at 11 months old. Um, and that's when we were pushed to have our first round of genetics testing with Dr. Anderson and Dr. Ava Marava, who was at Tulane Genetics Hospital. Um, and we saw Dr. Marava, thankfully she had seen another patient with what she knew immediately uh, was wrong with our daughter. Um, uh, we got our diagnosis, I think in May of 2014. So she was about 11, almost 12 months old. Um, with CFC syndrome, which is a rare de genetic disorder characterized by failure to thrive, sparse and brittle hair, heart defects, intellectual dis disabilities, short in stature with skin abnormalities, along with many others. There, that These are the ones that everyone notices first, are these uh, characteristics of them. Um, like I said, the first you know couple years of her life, she was a very ill child. Um, our hometown doctors really didn't have um, a clue that there was issue. There was an issue um, when we reached out to a specific doctor. We were immediately placed in the hospital because she was so ill, um, and that's really what you know got us on our journey towards uh, New Orleans, uh, Tulane Genetics with Dr. Marava and Dr. Anderson. Um, our GI specialist is the one who um, who really got that ball rolling where she was very well educated and knew that there was something just abnormally wrong with her. So that's where our journey began um, with our disease. Um, so can mom really work whenever we have a child with rare disease, having a child with a special needs, um, having a job and a child with special needs is, is, is very, um, time consuming. Um, I, my husband was a police officer at the time and I was working for the local ambulance company as an EMT, been there 16 years. Um, in the first year of her life, I think I worked 30 days total. Um, just because she was so ill. We were financially strained. We, you know, had one set of insurance on her. Um, and it was just, it, it was becoming very overwhelming. By the end of 2013 and the end of 2014, we had a medical bill debt of $1 million. I think it was, the exact number was $1.2 million. Um, we ended up reaching out to Senator Fred Mills, who became this lifesaver and assisted us in getting some of these taken care of um, after being met, denied for Medicaid for the third time. Um, he heard us, he fixed us, and um, we are forever indebted to this man. Amelie um, receives speech and OT services at a charity facility um, here in Lafayette, and she receives PT services um, at school. Um, the, the services that we do have to travel for are about 45 minutes to an hour from where we are located, from where our house is. Um, so getting to those services a little, is, is kind of difficult most days, having to drive so far. Um, Lee is nonverbal. She only walks very short distances, so her primary mode of transportation is a wheelchair. She's fed with a feeding tube. Um, a couple of her diagnoses or CFC syndrome, she's got heteroplasmic mitochondrial disease, she's got ketoacidosis, she's got a GRIN2A um, gene variant, she has a fatty acid oxidation defect, and she's also got um, an immune deficiency along with Raynaud's and some heart issues that we monitor, you know, monthly uh, with all of our physicians. Amelie loves school. She loved Disney World. She went in her wheelchair and she loved the princesses. She is, she, she's the light of our life. Um, with no immune system, she only attends school three days a week for three hours a day, simply because, um, you know, younger children are more prone to having snotty noses and touch everything and uh, touch everybody else. So she, we, we try to really limit her and get her in for the core things that she needs um, early in the morning. She receives PT once a month at school um, and she receives speech therapy at school in a group setting. And that is because our school system 
um, in the parish that we live is, is, does not have enough um, people to help, uh, employees to be able to facilitate getting our kids the services that they need, um, you know, in an appropriate manner. And then I will turn it over to Eric Hartman. He's um, with the, say the, say the foundation, Eric. <laughs> it is the Choroideremia Research Foundation. And I have choroideremia. And since no one can say the word, we call it CHM. I am uh, 63 years old, native New Orleanian, and uh, CHM is an inherited retinal disease. My mother was adopted, so we had no family history of it until around age 11, I had uh, a problem. I was actually supposed to be going to Baton Rouge to the state rally for social studies. I had a big project board and I walked in from bright sunlight into the school hallway to meet the teacher and she was gonna drive us to Baton Rouge. And I walked across two other project boards that were on the ground and the good nuns at Holy Rosary said either he's evil or he's got something wrong with his eyes. And I, it turns out I did have a very rare eye disease. Choroideremia is very similar to an eye disease you may have heard of, retinitis pigmentosa. In both those groups of diseases, I am progressively losing my vision from the outside in. And that's why night blindness starts because most of your night vision or our night vision is in our peripheral vision and our central vision is where the color vision is. And uh, it has been progressive. I, uh, at 25 years old, I had to stop driving. It meant that I had to choose where I lived and moved and moved, excuse me, until I reached a good location, which is mid city in the neighborhood where I grew up, which gives me access to the public transit here. But what I wanted to speak to you guys about is what is the power of rare coming together. I, was, I grew up with being told it's a rare disease, there's no hope, there's no cure. And it wasn't until the late 90s that I first met someone with my eye disease because of the internet. And by 2000, we formed our own foundation, the Choroideremia Research Foundation. And we were very, very fortunate in the early 90s, a doctor in Amsterdam met a guy with my eye disease and he said he knew 10 others. And that guy was able to give him 10 samples of blood and from which that particular doctor got the uh, genetic ID of our eye disease. And we became one of the first eye diseases to have that. But because of the foundation, and we are our mom and pop operation, and I've been on the board, the past president, executive director, and now I'm a, a director of advocacy, we have raised and funded over four and a half million dollars of research. We are missing one protein in each of our retina cells that is a transit protein. It takes good things in, it takes bad things out. Without it, the retina begins to die. And what we have been able to do is we have funded the research where we now have a gene therapy trial that is in phase three, and we're waiting for that information, and it will only treat a certain part of the eye, the central part. But we have also funded cutting edge where they will be able to treat the entire eye, so the next generation hopefully will be treated. But one of the things I wanted to let uh, other rare patients realize is the power of advocacy. We were able to go before the FDA and the CBER committee that uh, reviews biologics and we were able to educate them on the endpoints, those things that are important for the patients uh, to have a good quality of life. And we were able to do that and we are working with that. But one of the things I wanted to speak about here in Louisiana is the need for genetic testing. There are 260 inherited retinal diseases of which about 60 of them are considered retinitis pigmentosa. With our foundation, we have found out 
that over 70% of our members were living with a diagnosis of choroideremia, I mean, of retinitis pigmentosa until they got genetically tested. In fact, we had one case where a woman and her son were genetically tested and told they had choroideremia. And it turned out they had 48 living relatives that were living with a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. And what it meant to them is they were from a group of diseases that are, do have research in certain ones, but in our case, we have the hope of actual trials underway. And that goes so much towards being able to help support the families to realize what you can do. And I have been uh, working with Nord for uh, quite a number of years, and it's been a uh, really important experience. I've worked with uh, LSU and actually helped teach uh, a photo, uh, I mean, a, a video pre uh, conference of all their retina specialists to let them know about choroideremia because it is one in 50,000. Uh, so it's rare, but we think the vast majority of these patients don't know that. So we are trying to work to make sure that the major eye clinics uh, that have older patients that are diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa can get a further uh, validation of their specific mutation. And it might it very well be CHM uh, and for which we have a, a genetic trial. But from this, I just wanted to note that the power of all of us getting together, we now work globally. Uh, I've worked with uh, and, and given lectures on my eye disease to uh, about five different countries in Europe and Canada to advocate for the power of rare disease. And we are a very, very powerful force. We don't know the borders. There are no borders for choroideremia, but here in Louisiana, we are dealing with the services on a local basis. And I think helping promote the genetic testing of uh, rare diseases is incredibly important. And we need to be able to um, help fund that. And I'd say that's about it from me. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for um, showing up. I want to turn it over now to Angie Laborde um, with her daughter, Alexandra. Sorry guys, I was unmuting. My name is Angie Laborde. And as Libby said, my daughter is Alexandra. Um, she was born at 33 weeks old, and she um, had stopped growing in uterine at 27 weeks. So she was born with the developmental um, age of 27 weeks. Um, she was a surprise pregnancy a little bit later in life for me. Was not at all expecting <laughs> another child. Um, I had two that were about to finish high school. So she was definitely a little um, surprise and uh, she continues to put smiles on her face every day. I am a single mother um, of Alexandra. We were victims and survivors of domestic abuse, and we have been away from that situation since Alexandra was a year old. Uh, she was in the NICU for one month, exactly 30 days, and she was uh, released due to insurance really putting <laughs> a lot of um, pressure on the doctors to release her. Uh, in less than a week, she was readmitted into Lafayette General here locally and was in hospitals for the most of her first year. Um, she was transferred from Lafayette General to Women's and Children's. From Women's and Children's, she was transferred to Tulane. From Tulane, she was transferred to Texas Children's and Katy, and once we got to Texas Children's and Katy, they transferred her to Texas Children's main campus. Um, this was by the time she was six months old. No hospital was able to figure out why she was um, having the issues and episodes where she would stop breathing. Um, she was blue and lifeless in our, in our arms more than I can even count. We did get a surgery in Tulane. 
that um, was due to an incorrect diagnosis. They believed that she had something called Sandifer syndrome, which is an extreme version of GERD. And they did the surgery in order to um, correct that. And that's whenever we found out that this was not her diagnosis. She did receive genetic testing at Tulane and um, nothing was substantial, nothing was shown from it. Uh, we did have to pay for that genetic testing to be redone last year at the request of Texas Children's Hospital because they were concerned that there was an issue or something that possibly was missed. And we did find out last year that that was indeed the case. Um, Alexandra has something called MBD5 2Q23.1 gene deletion. There is less than 300 um, patients in the world with a variant of 2Q23.1 deletion or duplication. Um, and Alexandra is the only one of these patients that is also experiencing light matter um, degradation of her brain, glycogen storage disorder, and um, other very severe metabolic issues as well as mitochondrial issues. Um, and at this point, we're unsure if this is even related to MBD5 gene deletion. So Alexandra is a patient at the Undiagnosed Disease Network. Um, this is a network that is um, ran basically by Harvard and it is sponsored by the National Institute of Health. Uh, we're hoping to get additional answers from this, um, but I, I can tell you one of the biggest issues that I've had as a parent with a child with a rare disease is not only finding physicians that would take the situation seriously, but also not try to slap a generic diagnosis on a child. If you see um, someone that is going through or a family that's dealing with an issue that you may not have seen before, you don't try to give them a textbook answer. You try to figure out what's going on to try to save that patient. And I think that that's the biggest thing that we can do as a group of um, voices for rare diseases is to really ensure that each and every one of our patients, each and every one of our family members that are living with this understands that you're not crazy <laughs> just because it isn't textbook. Uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't a very valid issue that's going on. And it doesn't mean that your child or yourself and what you're dealing with isn't very valid. Um, Alexandra is not intellectually disabled. She is extremely um, intelligent and understands everything that doctors say whenever we're in a room, whenever we're talking about life expectancy. So there are certain things that have to be done um, whenever we're dealing with these medical aspects to ensure that she does not understand or get told <laughs> by a doctor um, how much time she has left. I have to make sure that nurses get her out of the room so that we can actually deal with issues in order to keep her um, happy and, and being able to live the best life that she can in the time that she has. Um, she is too fed. Um, she does have a, and she has been tube fed primarily since she was born and had a surgical um, feeding tube implanted in her at two months. Um, she does have to have continuous tube feeds because her blood sugar will not regulate. And without continuous tube feeds, um, her blood sugar, or even with continuous tube feeds, her blood sugar drops to the 30s, which in most instances, if you have blood sugar that drops that low, um, you have some very serious damage that's occurring to your body. So this is a daily minute by minute issue that our families have to deal with in order to just keep some type of quality of life for our child. Um, I know Libby did mark a little bit about um, what happens whenever you're, if you're able to work with a special needs child or with someone with a rare disease. And I can tell you that uh, I went from being a professional owner of a business management consulting company prior to her birth to literally only being able to 
ensure that my daughter gets to her therapies, ensure that my daughter gets to her doctor's appointments, ensure that my daughter is able to go to Houston once one week out of every month of her life to get the treatment and care that she needs. So it's not something that we can just stop and say, hey, I can go to work today. Uh, you can't even join something as simple as a consistent conference call whenever you're dealing with a child, not only with uh, special needs, but especially rare diseases. So that's our story. And I hope that you guys enjoyed that beautiful smile that you see with her holding up a trophy because Alexandra is full of life and very worthy. She is precious. Um, too bad you guys can't meet her because she, she is a doll. So Angie, thank you so much. As my friend, I want to thank you. Um, and as my special needs mom, thank you. Um, so now we are going to move over to our doctors. Y'all are lucky that y'all get to speak to two of our physicians who I love. Um, the first one is Dr. Paris. He puts up with me. And so does Dr. Anderson. They put up with me. They just smile and say, yes, Libby. Um, so here is Dr. Paris. He is an immunologist at Children's Hospital in New Orleans, Louisiana. Here you go, Dr. Paris. Sure. Um, so thank you guys for having me today. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to talk about. Um, I wasn't sure exactly the audience, but it looks like we have a mix of, you know, some parents and some other people who have vested interest in, you know, the care of children with um, some ultra rare diseases here in Louisiana. Um, one thing I was asked to do was to maybe talk about some challenges and, um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about some successes that we've had. You know, the challenges um, to, or for us as immunologists is that the rare diseases we take care of called primary immunodeficiencies um, are diseases that are difficult to diagnose. Um, patients don't necessarily have outright signs that they suffer from these diseases until they begin to manifest um, complications and recurrent infections from those diseases. That can occur years into the course. Um, even though these are genetic in nature, they don't always present at the time of birth. And there is often a delay in diagnosis of up to 15 years from the onset of symptoms. Um, some patients um, also, such as, um, you know, Libby mentioned, uh, patients with well-defined syndromes, such as, um, you know, her daughter's syndrome, may have a disease that doesn't necessarily typically have immune deficiency as part of it. And so, you know, it's difficult uh, in that way to make the diagnosis because some um, people don't recognize that those well-defined sy syndromes might have uh, primary immunodeficiency as part of it. Um, you know, despite that, we have had some successes in the last year or so. Um, newborn screening for the most severe forms of primary immunodeficiency recently was started here in Louisiana. Um, and it's been in place for approximately, I think, a little over about a year and a half or so on a full-time basis, um, allowing us to diagnose the most severe forms soon after birth. Um, so Louisiana has made some strides. We were one of the last states actually to implement newborn screening for the primary immunodeficiency diseases in, in the country. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say is that um, just like many of the um, rare diseases, my particular specialties rare disease has issues um, with reimbursement for medications, for all sorts of things, um, including genetic testing. Um, and what we've learned here is to partner with some of the larger organizations like you have, um, or like, you know, NORD, in order to implement that type of um, you know, service for our patients. So here in Louisiana, our center at Children's Hospital has um, partnerships with the Jeffrey Modell Foundation, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and they have 
especially JMF, has partnered with industry to provide free genetic testing for these immune deficiency diseases. So um, there definitely is some um, light at the end of the tunnel or some hope uh, that we'll be able to diagnose and treat these um, ultra rare diseases um, earlier than we would have 10 to 15 years ago. Thank you, Dr. Paris. Sure. Uh, thank you for showing up. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Um, Hans Anderson, who is the genetics physician at Tulane Medical Center in New Orleans. Hi, thanks so much, Libby, for inviting me. And um, I appreciate you all being here for this. Uh, thanks to Nord also uh, for the support that they give to so many of our patients. Um, that's uh, really critically important. And thanks to the folks who've given us their stories that are moving and um, clearly represent that we're just not good enough at what we do. And, and I'll be the first person to, to admit that. Um, so I think that Libby asked me to talk about what it is to be a geneticist in Louisiana. And so I put together a few slides. I'm not sure if this is um, preaching to the converted, but I just thought I would give you an overview of what we do in genetics in Louisiana, and maybe we can take questions or so afterwards. Uh, the arrow shows New Orleans, and um, the point of the slide is basically to show that between Baylor and Houston and UAB and Birmingham, Emory and Atlanta, there's a fairly big catchment area there in the Gulf Coast area and um, the genetic population in Louisiana serves many of those. Mississippi has a, a good genetic center in Jackson, but they're also very understaffed. So we see a lot of the patients in lower Mississippi as well as Alabama and uh, even from, from the panhandle. Next slide, please. So what a geneticist does in, in fairly simple terms is to look at patients who have, for instance, congenital anomalies and try to figure out what might be the causes of those congenital anomalies uh, with testing. We see many children with autism and developmental delay, sometimes with seizures. Um, the newborn screening positive babies for inborn errors of metabolism. And there are over 30 diseases that newborn screening uh, identifies the possibility of these diseases. So we see these kids for uh, further testing to rule in or out a diagnosis. And then when we have a, a diagnosis to follow them, they generally become our patients for life because they require uh, continuous uh, treatment and monitoring. Uh, so uh, in our cohort at Tulane, we at this point have over 400 patients with biochemical genetic diseases who need to be seen and followed. And that's a real challenge for us. Uh, cancer predisposition counseling and testing is also increasingly becoming available and an important part of what geneticists do for uh, the population uh, in the area. Next slide, please. So one of my needs is uh, more of me, more people like me. Um, the workforce is, is nationally inadequate and in Louisiana certainly so as well. We have about 4.6 million people in Louisiana and the Rough estimates that the few papers have estimated that we need are about two to four geneticists per million population. And that would suggest that variably we need somewhere between nine and 18 geneticists in Louisiana, and we currently have six. Next slide, please. So those six geneticists work either in New Orleans or in Baton Rouge. Uh, that's um, where they are resident in, in their employment. So two of us at Tulane, there's one now at LSU and the Tulane and LSU group are now uh, coalesced into one section in Children's Hospital. And I think that's a big improvement in the last couple of years. Oxner has two geneticists and there's one geneticist at Our Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge. So 
LSU had two geneticists in Shreveport until about two, three years ago when uh, both of them aged out and retired. So we've gone from about nine geneticists in 2015 to six currently, and um, that's, that's not the right direction. Next slide. So the, ident the, the care centers that we have uh, are at children's, um, the inpatient care centers, children's hospital in New Orleans, the NICU at Tulane, Oxner, uh, and Our Lady the Lake in Baton Rouge. You'll notice that all of these are south of I-10. There's nothing north of I-10 in terms of inpatient genetic care, um, and, and that's a big lack. Outpatient clinics are available uh, at Uptown, Metairie, and North Shore through Children's, through Oxner uh, in a couple of their locations, and at Our Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge. And then there are telemedicine clinics at Women and Children's in Lafayette, uh, Rapides for Cancer Only. We now do a clinic up at Willis Knighton through telemedicine. And then there are state clinics uh, in Lafayette, Baton Rouge, Hammond, Thibodeau, and Lake Charles. So we're trying to spread out as much as we can, but um, uh, Louisiana is a massively underserved area when it comes to genetic uh, diagnosis and care. Next slide. Genetic diagnostic laboratories are also a, a really important part of the care and monitoring of these patients. Um, at Tulane, we have the only genetic labs in the state and they are active and busy, um, but no lab does everything. And so we still have the need to send out a lot of testing. I'll tell you that in the last four or five years or so, uh, the availability of testing for many hundreds of genes, even exomes, uh, and genes such as the choroideremia gene uh, are much more available now than they ever were before. And insurance is uh, recognizing them as important tests to be paid for. Uh, of course, that means every patient may have a deductible or a copay or whatever. And, and that's, of course, between the patient and the insurance company. And that's another problem altogether. But these labs are also an important part of having a clinical genetics training program, which Louisiana doesn't currently have. But I hope that we can set one up in the next couple of years to try to uh, ameliorate the problem of too few clinical geneticists. Next slide. So my goal personally, or you know, for us in Louisiana in the next five years is to really hire uh, back at least three of the geneticists uh, slots that we have uh, vacated and maybe even to get more than those. We really need a geneticist or two in North Louisiana. Uh, we also need one in Acadiana, Lake Charles and Lafayette, Opelousas, that whole area is, has a tremendous number of patients and even the uh, three clinics we have in that area are vastly insufficient. Um, as I said, I'd like to establish a clinical genetics training program uh, at Children's and um, then to uh, you know, begin to address maybe through the advocacy of this organization, the fragmented nature of genetic care. And that's really true for all rare disease care. Um, we have a lot of problems with uh, access to care um, in especially non-urban areas of the state. Uh, so hopefully we can, we can make an impact on that. And with that, I, I think I'll stop and um, we can have discussion or questions if there are such. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, uh, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to David Nathanson. He's going to be the regional. Thank you. Um, so I want to just post these um, websites for you guys. It's going to be Stay Connected with the Louisiana Rare Action Network. You can visit us at www. 
or rarela.org, or you can find us on Facebook at the uh, LA Rare Action um, backslash um, for Facebook. And I um, want to also let you know that we will be um, having a little raffle at the end um, for our Zoom attendees for some Nord swag. There will be two members chosen uh, that were on the call today. So I appreciate each and every one of you for showing up. And I want to thank everybody, Angie, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Paris, um, Eric, myself, Alyssa, and Kristen, and David. Thank you guys all for showing up. Ms. Kim, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Kay Dodd, who is the, um, the lady who organized having Speaker McGee on. So I want to thank her also because she, she played a big role in, in helping us to um, accomplish this meeting today. So thank you guys. Thank everybody. And thank you to Libby for coordinating this wonderful event and finding us some wonderful speakers to be part of today. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and close out. We have a thank you, a short thank you video we wanted to play. Um, and then we'll stick around if you have any questions. Um, we can hang on for a few more minutes to address any questions that you might have. But thank you again for joining us today. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At NORD, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others, and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the volunteer state ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our states. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told when you hear hoofbeats, they think horses, not zebras. But what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At NORD, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. NORD support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, NORD, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at NORD, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community on Rare Disease Day and every day. And with that, we'll say thank you very much for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. And if there's any final questions, feel we can stick around, Libby and I can hang around and answer any additional questions, but thanks again. Thank you guys. It was a great presentation. So Libby, what do you think are the next steps here? I'll let Elise, I'll let Elise answer that. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, I think the next steps are, you know, I think we have a lot of um, diverse rare disease individuals on the, that participated today. So I think the next step is really forming out a coalition in Louisiana um, and having a meeting where we can talk more about what an RDAC could look like in your state and some of the issues that we would like to see addressed through an RNAC. And um, I think it was great to hear Speaker McGee show his support for an RDAC in the state. And I think, you know, the next steps is getting a group together and then hopefully identifying a potential sponsor that would be willing to help um, push that through. But I think, you know, the critical piece and, you know, we hear it from a lot of lawmakers is they wanna hear from their constituents and they wanna hear the personal stories of why this is so important, which, hearing you know, the stories today really helps solidify why it is important. So I would encourage you, if you know other people that might be interested in this effort, the more the merrier. So well, we'll I think one thing I was gonna point out, and I think I mentioned this to Libby in emails before, is that there are so many rare disease specific, disease specific groups 
Like in Louisiana, there's a PKU family group and there should be a way of identifying all of those groups and bringing them all into the RDAC and go to the legislature with all of these people. But all of those folks have to be part of this organization if it's going to be successful. I totally agree with you. I think it needs to be all, all hands on deck and showing that support. I know one of the things that we've done um, in Arkansas as the legislation's been moving is a sign on letter where we um, had several patient organizations from within the state show their support for it and sign on, um, you know, and have, and have them submit um, their support throughout the process as well. We also work really closely with um, the, the nonprofit patient organizations that are, are members of NORD and non-members um, to get the word out about this project RDAC um, and get their advocates and their community members engaged in their states that they reside in. Um, and we've been seeing really positive growth from that as well. And well, just, to, just to kind of second that, Dr. Anderson, I have reached out to the PKU um, executive director. I've also reached out to the executive directors of all of the families helping families in each region um, to kind of get them on board with voicing, you know, for special needs families and rare disease patients. So I, I have been you know, you guys don't know, kind of thrusted, thrust into this uh, position of taking over as the state advocate. So I'm, we're literally just getting the tires rolling um, 12 days ago. I mean, that's how I came into this, to, into this role. Um, so, you know, in that little time, I, I, I have reached out to PKU. I have reached out to Kia. Kia and I are um, in, in speaking where she can kind of direct me to the, all of the other, um, local um, advocacy and, you know, rare disease uh, networks in our state. So I am speaking with Kia. She's right. been helping thank with you that. For, so. Thank you for doing this, Libby. I know you don't really have time and energy to do it either, but. I do it. I do it, I do it for our kids. I do it for, you know, people like Eric, amazing people like Eric who keep, you but know. The more people we bring in also, the more likely you're going to find people with time to contribute to the organization that and maybe, you know, help you to uh, achieve right. the goals. That's right, yeah. Absolutely, look what she did in 12 days. We can't wait to see what she does in six months. Well, <laughs> no well, pressure, I've been, Libby. Exactly, no pressure there. Dr. I, Anderson, real quick question. I, I was really kind of stunned to see the limited number of geneticists here in Louisiana. I know that the resources have been, uh, are certainly uh, restricted here, but, when you talk about yourselves as geneticists, how many genetic counselors are there to also assist you so, uh, beyond that? Yeah, so there's a, a handful of genetic counselors in the state. We have two at Tulane, there's one at LSU, there are two, I think, at Oxner, there's one at Our Lady of the Lake, and then there are a couple of others that work independently. But, you know, in Louisiana, while they have passed licensure for genetic counselors, those folks mostly can't bill for their services. And so uh, institutions right. are, don't, are not interested in supporting their activities if they can't support their salary. And so they become physician extenders rather than independent workers. And so it, it's still a problem. We need more MD geneticists to do the, the medical care as a team. So obviously we work as a team with genetic counselors and metabolic nutritionists uh, and others as needed, but, um, but there aren't enough of any of those folks. Yeah. And I, and I guess, you know, in our case, the difference for me is with the, with an ophthalmology uh, rare disease, uh, there are, as you say, there are the assays and programs, whether it's through the Federation Fighting Blindness that works with Blueprint and people like that, that you know, for certain diseases, there there can be genetic testing. Yeah, it may not be localized, but you can certainly get. Yeah. We need to train the ophthalmologists to learn how to order those tests because what frequently happens is they send people with your similar diseases to us so that we can order the test for them, and that's a ridiculous waste of resources. So, well, you know, yeah, according to the statistics here in New in Louisiana, there should be almost. 100 patients with choroideremia. Right. And I, my brother and I are the only ones I know of. 
the ophthalmologists need to learn that this is a test they can order and how to order it specifically for their narrow area of ophthalmologic genetic diseases. They know they're sure. genetic diseases, but you know, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually I digress. That the national patient populations could do is create educational material for those ophthalmologists to say. Yeah, that's that's what my foundation is working to, working right. on right now. I think that but would be uh, very very helpful. On the legislative end, I, I mean, I'm I'm sure to to help. I mean, I've gone to the RDLA to the Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill for four years now, uh, but I've never done anything on the state. But then again. Uh, for me, it's also transportation, just getting to Baton Rouge, but that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. But uh, I'd be happy to do whatever I can virtually. As I say, one perfect COVID is that we can do a lot more stuff virtually. So I'm sure we can find some exactly. ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just to, yeah. to follow up with you, Eric, just right now, I mean, and I sound like a broken record about the, about the RDAX, but um, there are cystic fibrosis patients that are on six of the RDACs around the country. And I don't have to tell you, there's nothing like a, an, a, an impassioned, emotional, and sometimes an angry parent or patient to help them understand what this really means so they can make the right decisions around treatments and therapies. So um, I've seen it myself, and um, it's also a way, once those folks are on RDACs, they talk to their families, they talk to other families that are um, have have loved ones with the disease, so it, it sort of escalates. So that is super, super important, and, you know, I'm not saying anything that Elise doesn't already know, but it's it's super helpful. So true. Thanks for echoing that. And I'll just, I mean, I, th this is great, and I think that this is how these coalitions become coalitions, this, these conversations right here. And I think, you know, um, every stakeholder that represented here on this call is a patient, industry, medical professionals, researchers, you know, those are the stakeholders that, you know, are really, that, that encompass a rare disease advisory council. So, you know, for the, the, for the patients and caregivers joining us, your story is the most powerful tool that you have to bring to the table um, to advocate to get this legislation passed, to advocate to the council once it's in place and, you know, just share their challenges. And, and you'll be surprised as to how many common challenges, you know, your rare disease may be rare, but there's a lot of common challenges amongst the rare disease community that can be tackled with, you know, getting an RDAC in place. And we want to make sure that we're making this as easy as possible too. So, you know, along the way, we have what we call action alerts. So those are Email, so that's why it's so important to sign up for our Rare Action Network and put your email address in there if you haven't already so that we can inform you when stuff starts moving. Um, and our action alerts are emails that are um, set up so that they'll go to your specific members. And it allows you to, we, we format most of it, but then we have a section where you can put in your personal story. Um, and those go a long way because for them to be able to hear why this is important. And we try to make it so it only takes a couple minutes of your time to do something like that. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone feels like they can be part of the process, even if they only have a few minutes, to spare. Great. Well, Libby, again, thank you so much for, for putting together a, such a wonderful lineup of incredible speakers. And thank you to all you know, for sharing your stories and speaking today. Um, this is just the stepping stone, as we mentioned, 12 days in Libby is as our ambassador, but uh, I can't wait to see where we go here in Louisiana and building up this network and, and you know, really making some changes and hitting, hitting the ground running. That's Thank great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.